Anybody uh, hear any good jokes lately? <laughs> oh, there we are. Nice. All right. I'll get started. I'm going to talk about uh, producing gridded weather and wildfire fuel moisture um, at ADS here. My name is Scott Caps. Uh, a lot of this work is uh, work that I did with SDG&E uh, starting many years ago and now currently with Southern California Edison. So back in the day, about 2011, SDG&E meteorologist Brian D'Agostino, Steve Vanderberg, met up with uh, Tom Rolinski at Predictive Services and they realized they had some common objectives and that is to understand and predict wildfire, wildfire potential with the ultimate benefit of public safety and other, other motivating factors as well. At that time I was at UCLA as a postdoc working with Rob Favell who had decades of experience uh, forecasting and, and modeling Southern California weather with uh, specific emphasis on St. Anna winds. I realized while well, at UCLA and after meeting Brian and Steve from SCG&E and Tom, I realized there was a gap between academia where I was working with Rob Favell and who really needed this science and research to be applied. So we formed what I term the Southern California Weather and Wildfire Collaborative and we put in a conduit in between academia and the meteorologists, both at Predictive Services and San Diego Gas and Electric. And this is a two-way arrow I show here between academia and this uh, applied research. Because at UCLA, we learned as much from the meteorologists as they did from us. We wanted their operational experience. Um, and some of the strengths of this collaborative were that uh, we were all local experts with decades of experience. But most importantly, too, we had some clear objectives. And Brian made it clear, Steve made it clear, also Tom, that you know, we could do all this research, but we need something operational that we can use. And um, I list an example of some of those products here. High resolution weather modeling and fuels, the fire potential index, which you've already heard about uh, at SDG&E, and the Santa Ana wildfire threat index as well, all came about from this collaboration. So this, this touched off a, a string of work over many years. Uh, San Diego Gas and Electric, to my knowledge, as the first utility, started running supercomputers and, and running weather models locally. They currently have four of these, uh, two in operation and, and two for development and research purposes. So we started with a weather model, which I'll refer to as WARF, and it's a publicly available model. And using our operational experience and our research, and the San Diego Gas and Electric Mesonet, which I've heard mentioned already before, with a wealth of observations, we were able to come up with a validated and customized weather model. Once we had this weather model, we were able to run it back in time over a 30-year period quickly. That gave us the ability to uh, study past events and put uh, current forecasts into historical perspective. But we realized there was something missing. Now that we had this gridded high resolution weather going back over the past and we operationalized some forecasts, we still needed fuel moisture models. And so highlighted in yellow there is where I'll spend most of my talk today. Just some quick backgrounds for any of you who don't know uh, anything about fuel or fuel moisture when we talk about that. Well, there's dead and live fuel moisture, and I show a picture here with, uh, that shows an example of what dead fuel moisture or dead fuel is. Uh, those are those logs laying on the ground in various diameters, so anything from dead twigs to, to large diameter logs. And then the live fuel moisture are the plants that are still, still have roots in the ground and taking up soil moisture and growing. So we immediately turned to try to get dead fuel moisture on this high resolution grid. So we were running wharf operationally at two, well, at the time three kilometer resolution, now, now two kilometer resolution. We turned to a, a physically based model called the Nelson model. And this model uh, enabled us to generate uh, dead fuel moisture forecasts for various fuel classes, fine, fine twigs to larger diameter logs. 
on this grid. And we optimized the model. We also modified it and validated it using Southern California remote automated weather stations shown in the, the plot below. Uh, in the plot below are the weather station observations, which do actually use a fuel stick to measure uh, fuel moisture. And then the closest wharf grid cell is shown in green there. So fuel moisture index, indexes are, are cumulative indexes. The fuel moisture evolves over a long period of time, days, weeks, months. It's a function of cumulative precipitation, relative humidity, temperature, and, and thus the need arose that we had to cycle these fuel moisture forecasts among our operational forecasts. So if we were to predict fuel moisture today and go out five days, we needed this historical fuel moisture data to initialize our forecast from. And I give it a, an example of the uh, cumulative uh, nature of these fuels in the, in the bottom time series plot. This is showing your larger diameter fuel, dead fuel moisture content. Um, this is from that 30-year data set, uh, and the time span ranges from January to December. I highlighted two years that we can contrast and look at dead fuel moisture time series. Uh, the first in 1997, the blue line, shows how dead fuel moisture evolves from January to December. Uh, notice in January, it's spiking up, it's relatively high, we're having some precipitation events then, and then all of a sudden in February, our precipitation events fall off, and the dead fuel moisture of these fuels declines rapidly, and then by April and May, we're at 30-year lows. In contrast, 1998 was a El Nino year, and you can see the green line there uh, spiking various times through the spring, uh, relatively moist, all the way into June even. And when you compare those two, let's say in May, you can tell there's a, there's a big gap uh, in dead fuel moisture. And, and if you were trying to predict when your wildfire season was going to start later that year, uh, both for 1997 and 98, you'd, you'd have totally different predictions based on dead fuel moisture alone, but that's only one indicator. So we next move to live fuel moisture and placing that on a grid. So that's a little bit more, that was a little more complicated and challenging. Uh, we had several versions of this, but in each case, we're, we're working with sparse observations or sparse data, both spatially, as you see there in the bottom left corner, using the National Fuel Moisture Database observations. Those red circles are locations where they're measuring live fuel moisture. Uh, so spatially, they're sparse. Also, temporally, they're sparse. Um, at the most, maybe we're getting observations twice a month, sometimes not at all. So we had to do some creative data aggregation. We brought in our historical weather data again and uh, through some machine learning at the problem. And recently, we developed uh, two different models for live field moisture, uh, a plant type of chemise. We have a model for new growth chemise and old growth chemise. And, and new growth you can kind of think of as it's the fleshy part of the plant coming out, the green leaves. They're actively photosynthesizing. And old growth is more of the woody part of the plant, both of which are important for uh, wildfire spread. And uh, TechnoSilva will probably talk a bit about that later on how this data can be used and ingested into their wildfire spread models. So now that we have this, these live fuel moisture models um, created, we wanted to run back in time to see how they evolve over, over a period of history. And uh, currently, we're working with Southern California Edison as well as SDG&E and &E in, in creating multiple versions of live fuel moisture, where we're able to put it on a high resolution grid, such as the one shown here. And I'll just step through a sequence of plots of live fuel moisture starting back in November of 2018. So we're coming out of a pretty dry fall. Uh, we had a couple rains in October, but not too much. And, and as we expect, live fuel moisture, the percent is in the 50s and 60s for most of the state. If we progress forward to the 15th of November, not too much change. Remember, we had a dry start to November. We started getting rains late November. Um, so now we're at December 1st, 2018. You can see in the northern part of this domain, Life fuel moisture is increasing into the 80s. If we step forward through 
to uh, December 15th, we see live field moisture again <laughs> continuing to increase as it has more of that precipitation in its uh, short-term and long-term memory now. And as we know, December was, was a wet year, or was a wet month. Uh, looking at January 1st, live field moisture again starting to increase as well into the push into the 90s in the northern part of this domain. On January 15th, now we see uh, a faster rate of increase. Uh, it's it continuing to get precipitation, cold temperatures. And then finally, uh, February 1st of this year, we see most areas are pushing into the hundreds as far as live field moisture is concerned. So the model from our perspective right now is performing really well, but it needs further tests and we want to run it back uh, further back in time to really evaluate its seasonal cycle and how variable it is at shorter time spans. So another use for the historical data set that we produced, and, and, and sdg &E at the time was running some operational forecasts on a grid, and, and they were producing such products like this, or such intel that they can use. And, and we've heard the, uh, the May 2014 Santa Ana wind events mentioned already today. Uh, this is another look at those. Um, for a forecast initialized on the 11th, three days ahead of this, um, they could predict what's called energy release component. And energy release component is, takes into consideration your dead and live field moisture as well as other, other large fire potential um, indices. To give you an overall idea of what, how much energy is available or potential energy is available to the flaming front of a wildfire. And so in one graphic, they can tell what areas have extreme fire potential with respect to their 30-year period that they have data for? So the brown, yellow, and red colors are comparing your forecasted energy release component to the 90th percentile at this time of the year at every grid cell of their forecast domain. As you can see, as is typical with Santa Ana wind events where we have downsloping flow, the dry and the warm areas are hugging the coast. And this case is no different. As we've heard, unfortunately, we, we did have large wildfires that broke out. Another use for the high resolution weather data set that we've found and currently are working on with sdg &E is more from a vegetation management perspective. So heading into a wildfire season, they want to identify, they have limited amount of resources, they want to identify, okay, over our power line corridors, what are the trees that need attention now that we can go out there and proactively address um, given the coming wildfire season? In particular, let's say if they're expecting high winds, like a Santa Ana winds, wind event or something like that, um, they want to be able to pinpoint where those trees are so they can go out and, and manage those. They have a wealth of data, over hundreds, hundreds of thousands of trees um, with data uh, over their power line corridor areas. Um, we can get species growth rate, maximum height. Um, they also have tree-related outages data that we can throw at this problem. And then, again, merge this with our historical weather data that goes back over 30 years, use some machine learning, and produce some products and intel that they can use to identify those high-risk trees while there's still enough time to go out there and, and proactively maintain those and reduce those risks. So with that, I'd like to thank my colleagues at Atmospheric Data Solutions, Brian D'Agostino and Steve Vanderberg at sdg &E, Tom Rolinsky, who is now with SCE, and uh, Rob Fauvel, who is at SUNY. Thank you. Okay, now I'd like to introduce Dave Sapsis from CAL FIRE. He's going to talk about the California and Nevada Smoke and Air Committee modeling on demand for fire response.
Well, there's a green button and a red button. I hope I, hope I can figure this one out. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so this is a lightning talk. It's a talk about fire and weather. That seems appropriate. There's 15 slides, so 15 minutes, pretty lightning fast. Um, I do want to point out we're all sort of, I think there's a, been some really interesting conversation that's central, uh, sort of focusing in on information systems to inform us about the fire environment that causes, uh, causes hazard and ultimately um, conveys consequences from, from fire events. And today is a great kind of weather day, globally. What's today? Today's the equinox. So the sun is now hitting the hitting the equator perpendicularly, and we are now looking at longer and longer days going into our fire season. So uh, I'm actually giving this talk largely for Tim Brown from the Desert Research Institute that runs the CANSAC program. Uh, CANSAC stands for California Nevada Smoke Advisory uh, Committee, and it was conceived back in 2012 and became operational with regard to providing products to the smoke and air uh, community in 2004. Um, we've been receiving, you know, the, it basically operates under a board of uh, directors and, and it provides a, sort of the, the, the financial support for it. Um, the product re requirements as established are, are, are set up by an interagency operational and applications group, sort of providing that guidance such that the, the material that we provide is useful to end users. We've got a slew of sponsors out there, but we're looking for more. It's not cheap to support the kind of, uh, you know, meteorological modeling that we're going to talk about um, over the scales and, you know, over the periods of time that, that we're doing it. I will point out that my agency, CAL FIRE, is just in the process of developing our own support system for, for CANSAC, but there's, as you can see from the list, lots of players. Um, if you have needs for meteorological downscaled information that, that direct, directly relates to fire potential, please, uh, please contact us and, and we'll try and facilitate uh, getting products to you. Why is, is, is CANSAC important? I think there's been enough conversation today that the audience really understands that atmospherics have a tremendous amount to do with fire potential. Um, the, the notion of how hot it is, where the sun is coming from, how long has it been since precipitation influencing fuel moisture, both live and dead, all of those features are really, really important in driving fire potential. In fact, the fire services have used fire danger or fire potential as a main means of sort of situational awareness, awareness and activity decision support like dispatch levels for many, many decades. What's happening now is that the tools are becoming much more proficient at being able to describe weather across the nature of which it really varies, which is in both space and time. It's really an amazingly ephemeral, changing world that drives fire, be fire behavior. And the tools that are now emerging are providing us at least some semblance of a, of, of a capacity to, to start to describe that that complexity. Um, obviously, you know, we just need to, to you know, pre be able to predict when really, really severe kinds of conditions occur, like those that are typically associated with wet red flag warnings, but maybe even at much more highly resolved, um, both spatially and magnitudinally, kinds of descriptions. I think um, uh, Brian earlier was talking about the nature of, of Santa Ana wind events and sort of a frequency analysis of them saying that you have seven per year doesn't necessarily tell you all you need to know when one of those events might be different than any that has been experienced, let's say, in the last 30 years. So I think that there's a theme here about understanding weather data in a probability distribution that, that the modeling allows us to do to really tease out what kinds of thresholds exist under what kinds of extreme conditions. Obviously, understanding the timing of certain kinds of weather events is, is very important operationally to fire. The ability to predict where smoke goes, super duper important here. 
Not only does smoke cause a public health issue, but there are feedback loops between smoke production and fire behavior. When a column lays over onto an area that's burning actively, it obscures the sun and can cause really significant depressions in temperature and affect other elements, even you know, as temperature changes, so will relative humidity and so will fine fuels. So there's lots of interactions going on and um, the ability to, to uh, predict smoke is, is certainly very, very important. It creates a foundational operational sort of and, and statistical data set from which we can kind of get a handle on, excuse me, on what, um, what weather distributions are like out there in space. And I'll give a couple of examples of that. Um, I think with, a, with sort of a specific utility bent towards the end. Um, again, we're using the same model that's been talked about a lot, the weather research and forecasting model. Um, the domain that we're working at is a lot different than what Scott talked about, though. We're basically modeling two kilometer hourly resolution, but over this entire set of squares, three nested domains, as you can see on the grid, that captures all of California and all of Nevada. That finest scale resolution is where we've got that two kilometer grid resolution, which is currently about as far down as we think we can reliably go, although we're testing pushing it even further. Um, the, wharf, uh, the wharf environment really provides uh, al almost a staggering amount of, of atmospheric and, and weather types of information. Um, this table is just a product that we produce for regional simulation routines where three hour simulations of let's say wind speed and direction or surface temperature could be produced. These are the kinds of intel that would go to, you know, um, predictive services for regional forecasting, to incident meteorologists on fires doing fire forecasts specific to the operational concerns of those individual events. And in the case of air resource advisors, the three-dimensional dynamics of the atmosphere to provide that ability to do smoke modeling. Uh, again, just uh, you know, a few of the kinds of kinds of graphical products that we're producing on, under CANSAC using WARF. Here's an example of wind vectors at uh, uh, six kilometers for a particular day and color coded. Um, you know, the heuristics of the kinds of products that that come out of the modeling environment are pretty strong. We can able to convey information about what's going on relative to key environmental drivers of fire potential. Um, again, just I, I had a list here. I can't really remember all that's in there, but on the bottom is precipitation. You've got relative humidity. Um, you've got wind speeds at different profiles in the atmosphere as well as temperature. So it really does provide um, not just a gridded picture of surface conditions, but also the, the three-dimensional um, atmospheric um, change in, in, in key weather variables. And that's actually really, really important. We tend to believe that everything that's happening on the surface, because fires burn at the surface, is the only thing that's really important. Well, I think you heard a little bit about pyrocumulus and pyro CB kinds of events where fires couple with the atmosphere. The atmosphere dynamics ends up kind of taking over the gradient wind control over the fire. That's one example. Another example is being able to accurately predict where that, that, that smoke transport's gonna be. Here's one that might not be as intuitive. Under really, really significant wind events, the wind can kind of do this strange sort of thing where it goes down to the surface and then it comes back up and it goes back down. And we're sort of scratching our head going, well, I, I realized what happened to the fire when it was down at the surface. And, you know, let's say like in the case of the Butts fire burning into, into, uh, into Santa Rosa, you've got 65, 70 mile an hour surface winds and then they go away. Well, maybe they didn't go away, maybe they just went a, you know, a few hundred meters up in the atmosphere. Again, this three-dimensional picture of, of those atmospheric dynamics is one of the key, key sort of windows into inference of, about how meteorology and fire weather is all kind of driving what we're seeing, and getting a handle on that's really imperative. Uh, here's another graphic that is basically a metric of atmospheric mixing. How well do we think that smoke that's produced down 
on the surface is going to be able to transport itself ver vertically. Again, um, this can be important operationally on fires. It's a really good thing to have this kind of modeling when we're doing prescribed fire planning because obviously we want to increase the pace and scale of prescribed fire. What happens when we, we smoke out communities? Well, the, the community gets smoke and they call the local air board and the air board comes over to us and they say shut it down. Um, so we really want to have some feedback loops that provide this this dynamical modeling as an input into our prescribed fire planning such that we get just more proficient at building prescriptions that allow for that smoke to be transported. Just another example of how this model has, has significant utility in this new, new, new sort of paradigm of, of fuel treatment that, that we've been talking about. Uh, again, tons of different kinds of products. I, I've touched on, on, on a lot of these. Um, we're currently running these at, at two kilometer. Um, it's got a lot of temporal resolution that we can put into display kinds of products that allow for simulation and allow for that, that grokking, if you will, of fairly complicated model information into tangible bites that, you know, fire operations people, um, pretty much even the public can kind of understand what we're trying to get at, what we're trying to describe. Um, a lot of the graphics are really built around those kinds of, kinds of heuristics. Um, we do them at different kinds of grid resolutions because different kinds of things are, are sort of more easily described at more coarser resolutions like longer term trends, like what's going to happen with the weather over the course of three, three to five days, at, at recognizing that you've got greater uncertainty as you go out in time. With your modeling, we basically reinitialize this, 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 uh, the, the, these simulations daily, sometimes twice a day, and run them out for a period of time. But we're constantly sort of refreshing that initialization based on real input data that's measured. Again, I, I talked about how they can be used in a a smoke uh, modeling environment. There's a a playground called Blue Sky that involves estimating combustion and emissions, and then that, that gets linked to these 3D atmospheric transport capabilities and looks at, at being able to actually show the smoke. I think Adam, I don't know if, it, I do want to cue up that, that obviously there's a key input here as a potential improvement into uh, fire weather inputs into fire spread models. Uh, I, I, I encourage everybody to listen to Adam's talk this afternoon, and it's possible we might even show you that link to a smoke production model. I don't believe it's Blue Sky, I think it came out of EPA, but um, uh, it, it, again, it's kind of showing how these different models link together to give products that capture the suite of kind of fire impacts that we're, we're concerned with. Obviously, um, you know, these, 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 uh, these data are provided to the, to the regional geographic area coordination centers as input data to help them in their, in their daily forecasts. In some cases, they'll be used for spot fire forecasts if you're um, interested in either doing a prescribed fire or want to know something unique that the weather service might be able to tell you about a, a particular sector of a large fire. Um, there's some additional CANSAC related work that I'm more intimately related, uh, involved with, and that's the development of similar kinds of reanalysis re data that Scott had alluded to at the state level. Um, we're working on a very detailed hourly 365 day, two kilometer reconstruction. Um, we've currently got it at 10 years. We're extending it just currently, hopefully have the data in this next month or thereabouts. Um, for 16 years, and it will have the same sets of danger rating indices that Scott had alluded to that inform us about dead fuel moisture, about energy release component, and a number of other sort of key variables that we're trying to kludge together to see what kinds of atmospheric or, or, or fire weather signals can we find that relate to certain kinds of elements of the, of the fire problem. Um, you know, uh, I can't emphasize enough how this view of what constitutes climate, sort of coherent, hourly dependent data in its composite reconstruction is important. And that's largely because 
We need to have some reliable estimates of the probability distributions of this stuff to get at what the likelihood is of certain kinds of events. Certain kinds of events that might be the most important but don't happen very often. Some of the places, you know, just don't see 70 mile an hour winds ever in our record. Others might be seeing them every five years or every 10 years. And, and that should really be informing how we're doing some, some of our analysis, some of our hazard mapping, some of the scoping of our, our, of our regulations. Um, with that in mind, um, we are required by law now to incorporate localized fire weather into the state's fire hazard severity mapping program. Um, some of you probably have seen these maps. They are the state's version of a regulatory map for fire exposure to people and property. They carry with it certain kinds of regulations like defensible space and the requirements for new building construction to be ignition resistant. And in the previous rounds of our mapping, we didn't really deal with localized fire weather because we didn't think we had a good handle on how to do that. Um, this is going to be the technique by which we take that downscaled probability distributions of key inputs and key indices and incorporate that into the fire hazard severity mapping, including these really, really severe wind events that hopefully will allow us to provide inference on what portions of that urbanized landscape are, are, are prone to urban conflagrations. Again, those are pretty rare events. They typically only occur under hot, dry, hot, extremely hot, dry, and windy conditions, and us getting a handle on where those occur with what kinds of frequencies is pretty imperative. I'll just give a little bit of, exa of, of a, a contextual example about a metric that we created using the reanalysis data at two kilometer for a utility um, application. Um, Relatively early on in the stages of rulemaking for fire safety, CAL FIRE was involved with a number of uh, uh, technical export experts to create some initial pictures of what we thought the utility fire hazard problem was. And we created a model called an ignition potential. And in this case, it's based off of a index that we created based on wind speed squared times the old Schroeder um, ignition potential, which is actually a function of fuel bed temperature and fuel, fine fuel moisture content. Um, each cell on the landscape was based on an average of the top 2% worst days in the 10-year period. So we set a threshold, we looked at, at, at where do we have the worst fire days, and then we created this index of ignition potential getting at both wind as a force and drag feature and should, it, should a spark occur, what was the likelihood of that spark landing on the surface and, and causing an ignition? So I think, um, you know, sort of to wrap up, the, it, it's really a brave new world out here right now looking at some of the modeling capabilities we've got, looking at sort of new indices like San Diego's fire potential index, custom crafted to certain kinds of, kinds of management problems, and research questions. And I think um, we're really actually, these are, these are heady times, and I look forward to being involved with, with, with this community working on this, uh, looking forward over at least the next few years until I'm out of the game. So that's all I've got, thanks a lot. Um, okay, we're, we're heading into panel 1A, um, addressing how we assess fire threat potential. I'd like to introduce the moderator for the session, Tom Rolinski. Um, he's the fire scientist for Southern California Edison. Um, Tom is currently um, at SoCal Edison, one of the na nation's largest utilities. In this role, Tom is responsible for bringing together the latest science and technology to help build a comprehensive fire program for reducing wildfire risk across SoCal Edison service territory. Prior to join, joining Southern California Edison, Tom worked for the federal government for nearly 27 years, spending most of that time in fire weather. And in the last 15 years, he became a recognized leader in California's fire program. His pioneering approach to fire meteorology and his collaborative spirit has led the way in developing new tools to assess wildfire threat across the state. Here's Tom. <coughs> Thank you.
Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Um, I want to uh, first bring up the uh, panel here. Uh, we have four uh, great uh, uh, speakers here that will be presenting. Uh, so first off, I'd like to uh, bring up Steve Vandenberg, uh, meteorologist with SDG&E, uh, formerly with the National Weather Service. Steve, come on up. Uh, next, we have uh, Mary Glacken, who's uh, Vice President for Weather Business Solutions for the Weather Company. And we have, uh, next, we have Craig Clements, an Associate Professor of Meteorology at San Jose State University. And finally, last but not least, Matt Jolly, research ecologist for the U.S. Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station um, Fire Science Laboratory, Laboratory in Missoula, Montana. All right. Before we begin, I want to talk just a little bit about fire potential. We've been throwing that term around uh, all morning, uh, which is great. Um, but. As we discuss fire potential, uh, I think we need to kind of take a step back, and this is sort of going to serve as a framework for our uh, panelists and our discussion here uh, uh, coming up. But I wanted to talk a little bit about what do we mean by fire potential. If we're talking about a fire potential index, what is it we're indexing? What are we defining? How do we define fire potential? So that term is, again, getting tossed around a lot, uh, which is good. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, just for a minute or two, about what we mean by fire potential. It's really interesting. This is what I've been working with or working on for many years uh, with Predictive Services and now with uh, Southern California Edison. Uh, there's many, many factors that uh, go into fire potential. Um, you know, we look at weather conditions, we look at fuel conditions. Uh, we can make that very, it's, take a very simplistic approach to that, right? But uh, what we want to do is kind of get down into the details a little bit. When we talk about fuel conditions, our fuel uh, environment is extremely complex. We look at fuel moisture as sort of the low-hanging fruit that we can uh, assess fairly easily, but things like fuel loading, fuel continuity, um, those, those are much more difficult parameters to assess and those play a big part in fire propagation. Uh, so one thing I wanted to do is just, um, so anyway, I just kind of wanted you to think about that for just a second. Um, I remember, I think it was maybe 12 or 13 years ago, I can't remember uh, exactly the date, but uh, I was in a room with predictive services at our, one of our annual meetings in uh, Santa, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and we actually hammered out the definition which is in the National Wildland Coordination Group, uh, their glossary of terms, we actually define what fire potential was. And I'll read it to you, it's fire potential is the likelihood of a wildland fire event measured in terms of anticipated occurrence of fires and management's capability to respond. Fire potential is influenced by a sum of factors that include fuel conditions, ignition triggers, significant weather triggers, and resource capability. That's kind of a, I, I know it's a, a lot to digest, um, and again, we'll, uh, it's kind of going to set the framework here for our discussion. Um, but fire potential really could mean different things to different groups. We have a lot of fire agencies represented here today, right? Um, for the fire agencies, fire potential could mean the likelihood of a fire that would require an incident management team, right? But for utility, uh, it can mean the likelihood of, of starting a fire. So we want to kind of address all these things here. And uh, so what we're going to do is uh, each uh, panelist here is going to going to speak for 10 minutes. And then after all the panelists are done, we'll have about 15 minutes here for Q&A. So uh, without further ado, Steve Vandenberg. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we use fire potential at San Diego Gas and Electric. And I'm going to start by talking about an event that happened last year. And we already heard a little bit about it. Um, uh, from Tony Meacham. Hey, Tom, do you have the clicker? Is there a clicker for this? Oh, yeah. Thank you. So, um, 
Chief Meacham was talking about this event we had last summer, uh, July 6, 2018, um, in particular uh, the West Fire, which broke out near Alpine um, in the matter of a few hours, burned uh, several hundred acres and uh, uh, dozens of structures. Uh, and it was, uh, you can see there, averaging about a structure every 10 acres. And why this event, I think, is important for setting the context uh, you know, about what I'm going to speak about is, in this event, this was extremely unusual in that, obviously, middle of summer in Southern California, we're in fire season, so that's not unusual. But what was unusual is that the tools that we had developed were telling us that this was an unusually extreme event in terms of the potential for rapid wildfire growth. And we weren't in a Santa Ana, though we did have east winds. It was very hot and very dry. Um, and the days leading up to this event, um, you know, we were hearing a lot about the potential for, for heat, for a lot of heat. And if you turned on the TV, you were hearing about the big heat wave coming. And the focus was really on the heat. And of course, that's a big deal. Um, but at SDG&E, our tools were telling us that this event is a fire event. And so we actually treated it, in essence, uh, as like a self-imposed red flag warning. Our tools told us days in advance that this was, had the potential to be extreme, so we activated our emergency operations center, and we planned out uh, this event uh, in advance with canceling work, changing the way we operate, et cetera. And one final point I want to make about this is, there was no red flag warning for this event, and there were numerous wildfires that broke out on this day, and the worst one being the West Fire. And while that acreage is fairly small, it had a big impact on the community of Alpine. Um, and you can see there, what I've got um, on the lower right is, uh, the whole right side is the fire potential index product that we sent out the day before. So this was sent out on July 5th. Um, and this is what we communicated to our entire workforce the day before. So you've already seen this slide, so I'm just going to kind of use it as a point of reference before I dive into some of the details. But uh, just as a quick refresher, this fire potential index, this was the first thing that we developed at San Diego Gas and Electric to start to try to understand daily fire potential. Up to this point, um, we really didn't have much. We had some weather stations and we had whatever was publicly available, but nothing that was really specific to the utility. So we created this tool called the Fire Potential Index, which takes into account the weather, and I won't go into too much detail. It's pretty self-explanatory. The windier and drier it is, the greater the potential, right, if the fuels are, uh, are, are receptive to the fire. And that's the other piece is the fuels. We've got uh, grasses, dead fuels, and live fuels. So let's jump into that real quick. So these, this fuel component, these are the elements uh, that were most important from a fuels uh, aspect in determining fire potential in our region in San Diego. And the one on the far left there, grasses, what I have there plotted is a typical curve um, or, or plot of what the, what the grasses look like through the year. And that's NDVI that comes from satellite. We're, we're actually extracting data for very specific points on the landscape that are comprised of just grasslands. And that data comes in from satellite every day. And based on that number, we know if the grass is green or if it's cured or if it's somewhere in between. And you'll see that in the, uh, in the winter, you see obviously we're, in a typical year, we're quite green. And then we cure, those grasses cure out as we get into late spring and early summer. And then they typically start to green back up again as we get into the late fall or early winter. Obviously dependent on when those early season rains arrive. In some cases, they don't arrive until after the new year. So then we stay, you know, basically with dry, dry grasses through the end of the year. Uh, and then we look at the dead fuels, and Scott mentioned uh, how we do that with the um, Nelson equations. But the plot there, I think, is uh, the reason I put that there is to illustrate the time scales of the dead fuels. You know, depending on the, the diameter, they can, um, you're, they're changing on a scale of uh, hours to days. So the, you'll see that there's a lot of variability in that, um, in, in those plots, through the days and through the months. And then the last one on the right is the live fuels, which you heard about. And again, there's, you can see the seasonality there. 
So we start to see some rain in the fall and early winter. They start to increase in live field moisture, and then it really ramps up and peaks in late winter and early spring, and then they dry out as we get enter into the dry season. And, and one thing I want to emphasize about this real quick is that, you know, it's it's when all of these come into alignment that then you start to see the potential for wildfires really increase, particularly when the weather uh, is, is unfavorable, meaning in the sense that it's dry and it's windy. And obviously when we, the typical October Santa Ana wind event in San Diego, all those are gonna be in alignment. There's, there's really not much um, you know, mystery about that. But as we get deeper into the fall, it gets a little bit more complicated because you start to have rain events and that impacts your dead fuel moistures, but then have you had enough rain yet to cause that next generation of the grass to emerge from, from the soil? And then the live fuels typically don't really start responding to that rain, at least in a significant way, until deeper into the season. So even if you get a lot of rain in November and December, your live fuel moistures still take a while to respond. So you can see how, for us in San Diego, what we, what we were looking at is, it's typically that initial green up of the grasses and then those periods uh, of the wetting of the dead fuels that actually pulls us out of that peak of fire season. Um, but then as we get into the uh, late spring and early summer, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a little bit different. The, the grasses cure out. And so then you're starting to see more ignitions in the grasses. The live fuel moisture may still be elevated depending on the winter, but then the dead fuels are very dry and that offsets it. And so how all these things come together um, is, um, is what we were trying to solve. Really what it comes down to is, you know, we have to operate our system safely. And we, in order to do that, particularly in a place like San Diego, we have to understand the daily fire potential. And we had to create a tool that we could communicate easily to our workforce and that was understandable so that we knew that when we sent the product out, everybody knew what that meant and what they needed to do in order to mitigate their risk of, of causing an ignition. Um, you heard a little bit about this earlier as well, so I won't spend too much time on it, but basically, based on this rating, we, we send this out every day, it's a seven day forecast for all of our operating districts, and based on whether we're normal or we're elevated or we're extreme, that has implications on the kind of work that gets done, how it gets done, how many tools you need on the truck. You need a Pulaski, uh, five gallons of water. Do you need 150 gallons of water? How do we operate our system if there's an outage? You know, how, how's the, how do we go about restoring that outage? All of those things, all the work that we do on a daily basis uh, in some way, shape, or form is, um, is impacted by this fire potential index. And um, so that's kind of the, the initial tool that we created um, back in the early part of the program to try and assess what the fire potential is uh, so that we could, um, we could do, um, so that we um, could operate the system in a, in a safe and responsible manner. Um, since then, we have collaborated with um, a lots of people in academia and the government and the private sector in, in developing additional models that are much more sophisticated and, and can do uh, really amazing things. But I think the one point I want to drive home before I hand it to the next panelist is th it's really important that when you develop these tools and when no matter how complicated the science gets, the end product has to be really easy to communicate and understand, and it's something that a decision maker has to be able to look at and be able to make that decision right away. Because it can get really overwhelming when you're talking about terabytes of data, and you're, you're, you're talking about graphs and plots of all different shapes and forms. Ultimately, for us, what's worked well is, this is one example of those, is green, yellow, red. It's a stoplight chart, and it's really easy to understand. And so when we send this out every day, um, despite all the science that's behind all of the tools that we use, the person in the field, the lineman, the person that's digging a hole to put a pole in the ground understands exactly what that means for them and, and how they're supposed to go about their business. So um, that's what I have. Um, Tom?
I'm not real tall, so I thought I'd stand up. Um, so that was great, thank you. It's uh, been great to hear such great talks today. So in addition to being part of the weather company, IBM, I'm also the incoming president of the American Meteorological Society. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of, uh, I'm gonna stay on weather as my theme, not so much the predictive aspects of it. But uh, if you go to the next slide, oh, that's me, Never mind. Um, there's kind of two things I wanna talk about. I wanna kind of stay on that weather theme and uh, tell you why I'm so bullish on improvements that are coming there. They're being driven by uh, a number of factors. I'm gonna give you uh, a couple of examples for that that I think is only gonna improve weather forecasting. And then um, we do think at IBM that the internet of things and AI and machine learning is gonna to continue to make improvements in this field. And I wanna just tell you a little bit about what we're doing there. Uh, and I think it's a kind of a fresh perspective on some things. So with respect to you know, making a weather forecast, it's been recognized, it was recognized by us a long time ago. There's a lot of data here, and you can't have a, the forecaster in the middle of all that data. They have to be above it, and you have to be using tools. This is just a schematic that we use uh, in, that kind of lays out that we take in all of the possible data that there is. So it's all the open source data here. Uh, we heard a lot from the power companies today, um, San Diego, about how many sensors they have. Just to give you another data point, and this has all been enabled by how inexpensive sensors have gotten, uh, you know, relatively speaking, over the last 20 years. Uh, we have 12,000 personal weather stations just in the state of California here, just about 12,000 of them. So there's a lot of interest in this, there's a lot of data out here, so the, really the question is how do you put it together and make, uh, make the most use of it. But I really wanna focus on the modeling aspect of this, and um, if I go to the, uh, I'm gonna go to the next slide, but both um, the National Weather Service as well as we and our company are moving to um, a next generation of weather modeling. So we've heard, particularly after lunch today, a lot of talk about WARF, which was a model that was developed in the early 2000s. Uh, so we're rolling out a model that's based, uh, that same group that did WARF at NCAR has a new model called MPASS, and we've spent the last year kind of tailoring this model uh, for our operations. And one reason that we're going to this new model and the National Weather Service is going to a similar model that was developed by the Geophysical Fluids Dynamic Laboratory at Princeton is because it has a next generation of physics package in it. And really what it does is allows it to actually um, resolve at the thunderstorm level. So you'll see these models actually generate thunderstorms in them, which historically we haven't gotten out of those models. So there's a whole new physics package there that uh, we're, we're pretty bullish on. We've been running it uh, in test mode for that. But the other thing about this model is uh, we've designed it to bring in non-traditional sensor data. So um, I would wager a number of people here don't know that you're carrying around a barometric pressure sensor. It's in your smartphone. And if you opt into sharing that data, that allows that to come in and be used in models like this. So you have all of a sudden a lot of rich data set out there that's interesting. And then the third piece of this is that we have a new type of compute. Instead of using just CPUs, we're actually using GPUs, graphic processing units, and we've gotten significantly improved performance on that. And so that's allowing us, this model is gonna run at three kilometer resolution hourly um, globally, Ex not over water, but over all the land and populated areas. So think about that, three kilometers run every hour, and we're running it out for, for two days. So we're really kind of focused on that short term. So I think that collectively, these kind of changes, uh, weather forecasting evolves. It doesn't become revolutionary. You know, there's not a thing that I've seen in the 40 years of my career where from one day to the next, it's there. Um, but I think this is an inflection point with some of these things, uh, particularly the Internet of Things, I think is gonna be really interesting uh, for us to play out. And again, I do wanna make the point that um, the National Weather Service is moving kind of on a similar trend without the Internet of Things, and of course they have some, some large demands on them. The other thing I wanna talk about, though, is uh, you know if you have a model, that's great, 
and you're able to tailor that and run that a number of things. What we have really found, though, is you get the very best solution when you use an ensemble of models. So we actually not only use our proprietary model, but we use all of the ECMWF models, all of the UK Met Office models, the Canadian model, the Japanese model, and so we have like 178 different solutions that we start to work with. And this is really where the AI calibration comes in. Um, and they'll optimize for um, two things. One is what's the most, uh, what's the least error forecast, which is often very interesting. But the other thing, and probabilistic was also just mentioned this afternoon and we haven't heard a lot of it, is what's the, um, what's the chance that my criteria are gonna be met? What's the probabilistic? So I just have a little example with wind gusts here. You can have a probability distribution and the most accurate forecast might be, um, you know, whatever, 56 knots, but what you really care about is exceedance of those criteria and what's the probability of that happening. And that's what gets you to red, green, yellow on the charts that we've been seeing today when you combine it with an interaction of a number of these. So we're working today with like airline companies that have to make decisions around things like de-icing and what are the set of criteria to have them do the preparatory actions for that. And it's not just precipitation, it's winds, the temperature. You bring all of that together and you're able to make a better decision. Um, I do think, I love the, the baton I got in the handoff there, is because you have to make it so that decision makers can understand the information and make the decision, and that's a large part of this. We can do great work in the calibration and uh, improvement of this, but you've really got to have the social science work done that decision makers can be effective in that role. And then I just want to spend, um, uh, well, and I spend just a minute on this one, then I want to move on to the second topic. Um, but all of that is just making a good weather forecast, and I'd be remiss in saying that as a meteorologist, we don't stop there. It's really forecasting the impacts of storms. So we then use machine learning and AI combined with company data so that we're able to forecast what are actually going to be the impacts on your assets and uh, what does that mean. So you use historical data to do a level of calibration and then you do on the fly, real time machine learning on it so that you're constantly updating and improving your solution on that and allows all sorts of decisions to be made um, uh, associated with that. And then finally, I just wanted to mention, um, you know, IBM, uh, unlike many companies that were around in the 70s, still has a really large research division, and a number of my colleagues from IBM Research are here today. And we actually have what we call our Academy of Technology, um, which is, you could almost think about it a little bit of like a National Academy of Science and Engineering within IBM. So really motivated by the societal impacts that we've seen, not just here in Australia, but other parts of the world, they've undertaken an initiative um, to look at this whole topic. And um, these are volunteers that do it. And the beginning part of this is really to start with an evaluation of where we are with respect to wildfire de uh, detection and uh, assessment and prediction of that. So working across all of that. So we've been gathering up a lot of public source information and evaluating that. And um, we have some particular efforts to date that are here in, um, in assessing the, and characterizing um, the methods of detection that are there in doing some work in remote sensing and then in identifying an inventory and all the relative data sets that are there. Uh, we've been working with obviously a lot of remote sensing data, drone data, all of that other stuff. How, how does that come together? What are the relative contributions of this? So this is kind of a, a bottoms up effort that's driven by our research and I see my colleague Lloyd Trenish is over here and he's been leading on that. So I'll stop with that one and pass the clicker to the next speaker. Thank you, Mary. Craig. It's great to be here. It's an honor to be at this panel. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'll wait for my talk to get up here. But uh, 
I'm a professor of meteorology at San Jose State. I started there in 2007 where I started the fire weather research lab. It's, uh, to my knowledge, one of the only fire weather research focused academic programs in the nation. And so I'm gonna highlight, Tom asked me to do a academic talk here and my perspective on fire potential. So I'm gonna highlight some of the as things that we've been doing at San Jose State. Uh, so just to get you back into kind of the realm, we've been talking about weather on this panel, which is great. Uh, the fire environment triangle, which is the fire behavior triangle, is a function of three things, weather, topography, and fuels. And we've been talking a lot about the fuels, but it's the weather that changes the most dynamically and, and the fastest. And so I'm going to focus on those aspects in terms of fire potential. Uh, we've heard a lot about the standard weather station network. Uh, Basically, the ROS network, which is the Remote Automated Weather Station system, was developed for the National Fire Danger Rating System, and that's an hourly database. Uh, the utilities now are investing in advancing surface weather networks in California, as you've been hearing throughout the day today, and that's really improved our fire risk and uh, fire danger forecasting. And so if you've ever gone to a state park or a national park and you've seen this sign with Smokey the Bear with the arm, that's based, that, where that arm is pointing is based on weather data that is generated in real time. So that's the, basically the public interface with the National Fire Danger Rating System. And you're gonna hear a lot more about that with the expert uh, Matt Jolly next. Um, so one thing that we do, we, we, we've heard a little bit about live fuels today and generally the, the National Fuels Database is, are, are, is a database that's uh, based on data that are collected manually. And so there's a ground truth. I mean, we're modeling it and, and more, and there's the bottom point there, uh, new live fuel moisture models and SOTI and NFDRS, those are generating out, but there still uh, requires, it still requires manual sampling. And so here's some students of mine. We manage three sites in, uh, the, San, in the South Bay. They go out in the field twice a month to sample this, and it takes a long time to get these sites done. You need a laboratory. You, uh, multiple sites, the variability is based on the fuel characteristics. Uh, we also have to look at the live versus dead fuel ratio in these fuel beds, so fuels are very complicated. We'll hear more about that later. Um, so the large fire potential. What uh, I wanna talk about next is really the weather component of what's called the large fire potential, and this is from Rolinski et al. 2016, the Santa Ana Wildfire Threat Index. And so this is just basically wind speed times the um, dew point depression, so how dry the air is versus how fast the wind is. And we've compared, I've had a student that actually compared multiple indices, including a new index that was uh, uh, published by the U.S. Forest Service called Hot Dry Windy, which is a more simple index. And there's also Fosberg, which I can't see this because I don't have a computer here, but I think it's the green line is Fire, the black line is fire weather index, green line is hot, dry, windy, and the red is the uh, large fire potential. And so if we were looking at a non-wind uh, driven fire, let's take the, the car fire and the um, Mendocino complex, the gray shading are the biggest days where we had the largest acreage burned. And it look, and you can see that all the indices kind of perform fairly, fairly well. They, they kind of jump up in their values, and these are relative, so we could, we could scale these differently. But on those days where we had the biggest acreage, those three indices performed pretty well. If we look at some of a, uh, whoops, sorry, ah, not back. There we go. If we look at the wind driven fires, so here's the Thomas fire and the Camp fire. You can see that the uh, large fire uh, index uh, performed much better from the Sati. You can see it just really highlights those cases. And whereas the hot, dry, windy index doesn't perform as well. So, what I'm getting at is there's lots of different indices in terms of looking at different fire uh, potential and, and fire risk, and it, there's, these indices can be used out of uh, gridded data sets from WAR for numerical models, or we can compare them just on the ground with uh, ROS stations. So these are just surface data. And so it's working. So this large fire potential index is working to highlight these big acreage burn days. Um, I want to talk next about something that you've all heard about the Diablo winds. This is basically Northern California, Santa Ana. It's a downslope windstorm. I had a student who uh, now works at SDG&E, Carrie Bowers. This is her master's thesis. And you're seeing this panel. It's a cross-section from uh, Coffee Park in 
Santa Rosa, and it's showing the downslope winds forming with a hydraulic jump there. You get this wind attaching to the surface, and then it lifts up, and so this is a very strong downslope wind case, and so she simulated it with wharf. It's less than one kilometer resolution. But she also did a climatology, and what we found is that these wind events in Northern California occur about two and a half times a year. They occur, if you look at the bottom panel with the, the blue uh, bars, so the highest frequency occur in October, and if you see the dashed line in that same panel, that's the live fuel moisture content from observation, and that's the lowest. So the most frequent time we have these downslope windstorms in Northern California, it's the same time when we have the most critical fuel moisture conditions. So that's why we have a lot of our big fires in October in, the, in Northern California. Moving on, I just want to talk about some observations that we make uh, on active wildfires. This is the CSU a Mobile Atmospheric Profiling System. It's basically a truck with wind profilers and temperature profilers and such. And we have a number of tools on here that we can take to active wildfires. So my whole team is Fireline qualified and we're actually listed in Ross as a national resource so we can go to any incident. And so what I want to highlight is that if we were to look at a surface weather station, this is one minute data from our truck during a Santa Ana event of 2014. You can see uh, the green hashes are very, they're real variable, that's the wind direction, and we're talking winds of one mile an hour. This is the marine layer. If you go to the beach in California in the summer, you're in fog. It's 55 degrees Fahrenheit, it's nearly 95 to 100% humidity, and it's foggy. And what you're seeing, there's a big shift in the humidity where it drops right there. I don't have a pointer, so I can't point it out, but it should be pretty clear where the winds go directly east. And that's the Santa Ana hitting the surface in a matter of minutes. And so we can go from non-fire conditions in one minute to red flag warning conditions in the next minute. And so if you look at a wind profiler, we had our truck there and we were scanning vertically through the atmosphere with our laser-based radar. You can see the rapid onset of the downslope wind events. So we're moving from the marine layer to very dry conditions, and that air moves from aloft to the surface, up from the t uh, higher in the atmosphere down to the surface very quickly. And so, not saying that surface networks aren't, aren't useful, but we need to think about the vertical structure of the atmosphere, which Dave mentioned earlier, when we're looking at some of these dynamic uh, systems, and particularly downslope windstorms. So we deployed to the campfire on the day that it ignited, and I want to just highlight this upper panel here, you can see that winds are really light near the surface, but just 100 meters above the ground, we're talking 40 mile an hour winds. And these are the gusts, so we have these upper level winds that get mixed down to the surface, and that's what's driving the gust at the surface on these winds. And this, this fire was, uh, you know, lots of spotting, long distance spotting, a w very strong wind driven fire, we have very strong winds. The bottom panel there with the shading is smoke. The smoke has uh, remained within a kilometer of the boundary layer of the surface, so the plume is tilted over. And you can see some of our wind vectors there as well. So this was actually right on the flank during that fire. And you can see, a lot of times you can actually see fire-induced winds where winds are being driven by the fire front itself. And so it's very hard to measure that. Surface networks don't capture that. You have to have this mobile atmospheric profiling system or, or some other tool to really capture these fire-induced circulations. And so uh, a student of mine is actually doing uh, numerical modeling and analysis of this case. That's the, the radar and the dew point and the winds. And so downslope windstorm with some gap flows near paradise, uh, critical fuel moisture uh, conditions. This is from NFDRS 2016. So a student calculated these uh, values. We're talking four to seven percent for both the, the one hour through the 100 hours so of really critical dry fuels. Um, ambient RH from our measurements was 14 percent. So these are critical conditions. Okay, and so in my last couple slides, I just want to highlight what we're doing at San Jose State. Uh, not only do we have the mobile atmospheric profiling systems and a new radar coming online, we're also developing a, a network of research field sites, and so. While we're always using like raw stations and the operational networks, we're the only phenomenon in atmospheric sciences that doesn't have a suite of basically research grade field sites to calibrate models, to calculate NFDRS, to do consistent fuel moisture sampling at where we have the meteorological data at the same site. Generally, fuel moisture sampling is out randomly, hiking in the hills, clipping some shrubs, and coming back. But if we can pick one site or multiple sites, let's say, considering our network, 
and we have the meteorological data there, we can actually look at more of the science with the fuels. And so uh, another thing that we're doing is we're working with a, a local vendor to build small radars for fire detection and for looking at plume dynamics. So these small radars can be put on raw stations and scanned 20 miles out. And so it's an exciting time in terms of technology in wildfire and fire weather science. Okay, so just quick summary. Uh, what we found with the large fire potential is that correlates well with large wind-driven fires. Uh, it does not explain uh, extreme fire behavior all the time. Uh, other indices work, but not for the uh, wind-driven events. Uh, again, we need a relationship between uh, fire potential and spotting. It's not well understood. Lots of things with fi live fuel moisture monitoring. It's critical for fire danger and for large fire potential. Uh, largest fires are associated with critical uh, live fuel moisture, like I showed with the uh, Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa. And then live to dead fuel ratio is needed. We need to understand the fuel structure and the fuel loadings for all these cases as well. And then so with this uh, research network, uh, testing new technologies at fixed sites that are well calibrated and managed, and uh, that allows us to evaluate the next generation fire models. So thank you. Thank you, Craig. Matt. Good afternoon. Hope everybody's having a good day. I want to thank you for the opportunity to come join you today. My name is Matt Jolly. I'm a research ecologist with the Rocky Mountain Research Station Fire, Fuel, and Smoke Science Program. I work at the Missoula Fire Sciences Laboratory. Uh, this fire potential thing for us isn't new. So our laboratory has a uh, very long established history in um, exploring what fire danger and fire potential means. Uh, all the way back to the days of Harry Gisborne in the 1920s who roamed around uh, the mountains of northern Idaho and created the first fire danger rating system. Um, so I, my day job is to be the science lead for the National Fire Danger Rating System for the U.S. Forest Service um, and to disseminate that to all our interagency partners. Uh, through that job, I do two things. We explore science, science opportunities to improve um, the models that we use for decision making, but I also work directly with firefighters to, to talk about how we actually apply this information. Um, because everything that we talk about here, and to reiterate what, what's been mentioned a number of times, is that this is a decision support system. It's meant to provide key metrics uh, to change what we do under a given set of, set of conditions. So uh, with that in mind, we, um, it's really important for us to start to, to continually evolve these tools and we'll share with you a little bit of the things that, we're, that we have uh, in the hopper that, that we're working on now that are meant to uh, help inform decision making. Um, one of the reasons it's important is because things are changing. So we know that across the United States, particularly across the West, the fire seasons are getting longer. Um, they're not just getting longer, uh, the within conditions during the fire season are getting more severe. So we're, we're observing conditions or combinations of conditions where, where, that we've never seen before. Uh, firefighting is by, by very nature an organization of, of experience, an experience-based response. Um, so it's getting progressively hard to understand how to apply experience uh, when we've never observed these conditions before uh, in all of history. So these tools, these decision support tools that we talk about are super critical in bringing together a ton of information and providing these key um, decision support metrics that can really guide what we do and where we do it, uh, mostly uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, we use them for operational, we use operational tools for situational awareness and for risk management, um, but we also use them for, for communicating conditions both inside our agencies and to outside agencies, uh, inclu or outside people, including the public. Um, so these, these tools have multiple purposes and they have the potential to help us start to, um, to adapt to these changing weather conditions so we can start communicating the alignment of conditions that have never happened before. And to really start to use this information for, to maintain um, that situational awareness that's critical for, for both our responders and for the public. Um, the simplest way to think about fire danger rating system is that, that it takes weather. Um, as we've already talked about before, um, the whole idea is that it takes weather observations from whether they come from a, a point, set, point source, a remote automated weather station, or from a grid, um, and, and it calculates some series or set of fuel moistures 
uh, to create an index. Um, a lot of people stop talking about it at, at the index part. They're like, well, we made an index. Um, but the reality is, is how do you translate that index into a decision support metric that changes behavior? Um, and that's really where, where we're struggling now, um, really interfacing a lot with our, with our firefighting community to start talking about how do we build these things in. Um, we, we know um, we're in the process right now of releasing the first uh, revision to the National Fire Danger Rating System in 40 years. Um, it's set basically dormant, um, and no one really picked up the ball to, to start plugging in uh, better science into this system. Um, so that's what we've been doing for about the last decade. And we're uh, releasing that to the field uh, um, as we speak. But as, as a part of that, we've learned an awful lot about, about the good and bad parts of these fire potential or fire danger rating systems. And we've been able to really kind of build off of those things or leverage them. Uh, so one of the things that we recognize is that our historical way of, of doing fire potential assessments or fire danger assessments is to do them at a, at a weather station. A remote, and, and now they're automated, but in the past, uh, people would go out once a day and they would sling weather and they would write it down on a piece of paper. They would go to a set of tables, they would calculate fire danger, and they would use that to communicate fire danger across um, all levels of management because these fire danger or fire potential systems support national level decision making, regional level resource allocation decisions all the way down to local levels that decide how many resources to, to send to respond to a fire or even to, to do things before those fires start uh, from a preparedness perspective. And all those things really, really lead us to a new place. But, but we're, um, we're now moving towards this gridded forecast system and then really trying to combine the best parts of the NFDRS into something brand new. Uh, to do that, we have, we've created a system uh, that builds off the National Fire Danger Rating System, incorporating gridded forecasts, and then also leveraging our remote automated weather network uh, to kind of get the best of both worlds. So we bring in our, our uh, heavy dead fuel moistures as initialization for a forecast. We bring in the forecast from the National Weather Service, the National Digital Forecast Database, which um, provides us with a, a continuous forecast across the entire country at two, two and a half kilometer resolution and we use that to drive these NFDRS calculations. The whole purpose of NFDRS is to create these indices, but what we found is that the indices don't really mean anything um, at a national scale until you normalize them by, by place. Um, so we use climatologies to normalize those indices to percentiles. I'll show you an example of the percentile map um, next, but um, essentially we'll have a forecast that tells us about the energy release component uh, percentile for the day across the entire country. Um, and then a forecast that tells us about the burning index for the day. So the ERC tells us how hot and dry it is. The burning index tells us how windy it is. And when we combine it together into this metric we call a severe fire weather potential, it tells us how hot, dry, and windy it is. But which is when fires burn best. So the, so the idea though is that uh, combining these together seems, seems like a no-brainer, but it's a uh, it is in some cases fairly new. So we're leveraging uh, the established ERC, building on it with, the, with this BI, and um, coming up with this with an index that's much better suited for, for it looking at day-to-day -day changes in fire potential. Um, so if we look nationally across uh, our data set at what percentiles look like, so these are, these are just maps of the raw values that come out of a fire danger rating system. So what we found when we made the first of these forecasts is we make an ERC forecast and it's always red in the southwest, it's always green in the southeast, and it's always somewhere in between in the mountains. But what we know is we have to interpret them based on what's normal for a particular place. So when we do that, we leverage these um, percentiles uh, from the climatology to, to generate those daily percentile forecasts and we get something that's totally different. And one of the things that we can do now is take that whole data set for the entire country for um, the last couple of decades and compare it against fire activity. So these are four plots that talk about, that compare our the metrics of NFDRS uh, normalized to percentiles uh, for the entire continental United States for about 25 years. From agency fire reports on the top and active fire detects on the bottom. So what we see basically is a clustering in that upper right-hand corner. 
which is a good thing. It means that, that both the ERC and the burning index are telling us something about fire potential, about when we see, when we see fires, when we see the largest amount of burned area, when we see active fire detects from MODIS, and also when we see fire intensity above a certain scale. So all those things are good indicators that this metric of combining these, the, these two pieces together tells us something we didn't have before. I want to give a nod to our folks with, uh, from TechnoSilva, too. We're partnering with them to, uh, to take this technology and start making it more accessible. One of the things that's uh, very difficult for people that work for the federal government is to do something new. Um, <laughs> so uh, our challenge is that how do we take something that, uh, that we innovate and how do we move it into or put it in the hands of the people that really need it? Because this information is very critical. So this, this wildfire safe app that we're, that we're finishing now will provide a summary of these forecasts um, to decision makers out for seven days, uh, right, at, right on their mobile device and on a tablet or a desktop PC. Uh, it integrates with the, the Irwin the automated fire reporting system, and it'll also provide information about the fuels, the terrain, and the values at risk in addition to the weather. So I'll summarize for every fire that gets reported. And we've been, gener we've been doing this for, uh, We've been producing these operationally for about three or four years, um, and we've learned a lot about, about what it can actually tell us and how it can help. I'm just gonna close out with a couple of examples. Um, these are four maps uh, produced at four different times of the year. So early in the season uh, with, with a, a very large fire that occurred on the Oklahoma Panhandle in, that ver in the red area in the central part of the country. Um, Later in the year, um, in late July, early August, uh, an image from a, a day where a fire in western Montana grew extremely large and threatened communities. And then two other examples, one uh, from October 2017, uh, from where the Santa Rosa fires started. Um, and then the other one on the bottom, which looks like nothing, but if you zoom really close in, you can see one little tiny spot of red uh, where the Thomas fire started for that day. Um, so the great thing about this is this is a national resource that is normalized nationally, but that performs incredibly well for California. Um, here's a little more somber approach. Uh, we took the same information and we went back and looked at firefighter entrapments and fatalities for the, la for the last approximately 40 years. So we have a database of 178 firefighter entrapment or fatality events. Uh, across the country, and we see that when we compare it to the metrics of our fire danger rating system, that uh, we have a very strong clustering in the upper right-hand corner of that plot, indicating that those are conditions where, where it's hotter and drier, way hotter and way drier than normal. But the most important thing about this is we can map those conditions ahead of time. These are things that we can know ahead of time. The, the, the plot on the right is the, is the combination of the two um, of our severe fire weather potential showing that 62% of all firefighter fatalities occurred on 3% of the days. So these are real tools that have real utility um, for risk management and safety, but they also have real utility for informing communities. So these are five forecasts that we produced uh, from in 2017 and 2018. I'm going to guess that you can guess which fires they're for. What you, what you can't guess is that these aren't done after the fact. These forecasts were produced before the fires ever started. So the red areas on the, and the, the top left is the Santa Rosa fire. The middle is the Thomas fire. The one on the right. is, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Car fire. Yeah, thank you. And, and then the bottom left is the uh, Mendocino complex and the campfire. Sorry, I'm also, I'm also um, I can't see very well and I, I broke my glasses about 30 minutes ago too, so, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, the key here is that this is an operational tool that uses forecast, the forecast fire potential that is summarized to a categorical system that's easy to tie to decision making, that has absolute power in predicting when and where events happen. The real key is how do you put this in the hands of the right people so that it changes behavior? 
It changes behavior of a community, changes behavior of a firefighter. It changes so that we can start getting ahead of these events. Thank you. Matt, that was a perfect uh, segue into, um, uh, I took some notes on uh, all of our speakers and um, there was a very common theme that ran through all of their presentations. So uh, first of all, uh, I just, we've got some time for questions, so uh, folks that want to ask some questions, uh, you can start lining up at the mics here, but before, as you're doing that, uh, so one, one thing that I picked up on is, was communicating fire potential, right? How, how do we communicate risk? How, how do we communicate the threat of fire activity to our communities, uh, to our customers, for the utilities, to our utility companies? Um, you know, when we were putting the, SOC, the Santa Ana Wildfire Threat Index together, we worked with the social scientists. How do we communicate the threat for large fires to the public, to the fire agencies? It's difficult because we're dealing with a lot of information, a lot of weather, a lot of fuels information. How do we distill all that down and communicate it in a simple manner that's easy to understand so I think, uh, you know, uh, Craig mentioned Smokey's Arm. The, the U.S. Forest Service has been extremely successful in uh, communicating, taking the National Fire Danger Rating System, which is very complex, and simplifying it to Smokey's Arm. And that's something everybody can understand. So I guess um, my question was, or, or maybe it's not a question, but if you guys, uh, I'll just allow maybe, um, a few of you or all of you to take a stab at just kind of commenting on communicating fire potential, communicating risk in your mind, how, how does that work? From maybe a utility standpoint um, and maybe talking about uh, to the public. Anybody? So, um the, the hard part, I think, in all this, and this is, I think, what you're getting at, is you have uh, some scale, and it says, you know, low, or it says high. How do you translate that into action? Um, because ultimately, for these things to be successful, it's not just, so from the utility perspective, there are things that we're going to do ahead of time to, to reduce our risk. To, to mitigate that risk of an ignition. But then what about, you know, the, the folks out there in the community or that other industry, right? So I think that the challenge is not just in having a simple, you know, way to communicate a tool, but is it actionable? Um, and so how you do that, it depends on the audience. For the utility, you know, to, to develop the breakpoints for the fire potential index, um, before it was of any value to us at the utility, we had to look at the probability of fires of different sizes occurring at different FPI ratings based on historical fire occurrence, and then understanding how we operate our system and combining that data to make the breakpoints. But then even still, if we, you know, if we communicate a number to our workforce, again, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. So then how do you turn that into a scale that people can then use and it's actionable? And that's what we did with the FPI for the utility. And I think you have to understand the end user in order to really take, a gr take great science and a great tool and turn it into something that's actually actionable. Yeah, I, I want to make a comment, um, you know, beyond, I want to make a comment about broader weather phenomena. And I would make an observation almost that our ability to forecast some threats have outstripped our ability to communicate them, um, where people aren't taking the action we need them to take or they're totally surprised by the outcome. And I could just focus on hurricanes for a minute because I think there's a warning lesson here for this community. Uh, so Irma came through Florida in 2017, I believe, and you know there was a whole thing about was it going to come up the East Coast and the West Coast, and the cone was out there, and the you know cone of uncertainty and everything else, and it never moved out of the cone of uncertainty. But people were absolutely shocked that it tracked you know 25 miles in the other direction. 
Um, and uh, you know, the same thing with Harvey, the, Harvey in Texas, it was an excellent forecast, but people could not comprehend 50 inches of rain. You know, we, 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 we fell down in describing the impact of that. So I think one of the, one of the lessons uh, that I take away from some of these things is in the communication, we have to make the, th the threat personal and local to them. Like I think we spend too much time in hurricanes describing what the hurricane look like, looks like and you know, the winds and everything else, and not enough time in describing what's the one scenario for Tampa Bay and what's the other scenario for Tampa Bay and what's the range of flooding for those. You know, we need to spend more time on the impacts. And when I translate this into wildfires, you know, it was mentioned just a little bit here, but smoke. You know, that's a whole different you know, who you're warning about smoke and what do we tell them about it? Um, besides it's going to be smoky, you know, is a whole area that I think, I, I know the National Academy of Sciences is going to kind of do a review in this area as well because we seem to be woefully behind in any kind of warnings and alerts and conditions, you know, actions that should be taken. I guess from the uh, academic perspective, I teach a class in uh, general or wildfire science for non-science majors. And so one of the exercises I have them do is I want you to explain fire danger on a bar napkin to somebody in a pub or a coffee shop and real quick. It's a five minute exercise. How would you do this to somebody who doesn't understand either climate change or fire? And so they have to write it on a very small piece of paper. So simple words, simple diagrams. And I think a lot of these uh, products have that with the SATI and FPI. So like color bars, smoky, those kinds of things. So keeping it simple with simple words and making it uh, something that could be thought of quickly. Yeah, great. Does this thing work? I think um, another piece of this is that, um, that we still need to, to keep these metrics really simple. So it, there's a tendency for science to, to say, oh, well, I'm gonna give you the probability of, of a fire happening today and they're gonna give that to the fire manager and they're gonna expect somehow that that's gonna change their behavior. Um, it, I still come back to the, to the need to, to make a categorical system that's easy to communicate and easy to interpret, uh, but also to use that in a pre-season planning effort when there's, not, when, when there's not chaos of wildfires. That's our only chance of actually getting ahead of most of these things is to leverage pl this pre-season efforts to say what is it we're going to do under this certain set of circumstances that we can map as this color red or this color orange um, and create that that learning loop so that we can we can apply it and we can go back through our AAR process and and we can say how well it worked and then we can modify it um, so they so that they're not set in stone but I th really think that that categorical um, decision making is, is key to all of it Thank you. Uh, those great responses. I think the, uh, you know, as the, again, as they were um, formulating their comments, I think, uh, again, how do we communicate risk? And that's why I went back at the very beginning here to talk about what do we mean by fire potential? What, did it, what is it that we're communicating or trying to communicate? Um, and, and how do we, I think Matt made a great point, how do we how do we uh, uh, bring about change in changing people's behavior, right? I mean, we think about with the fire agencies having to evacuate people out of their homes. How do we get people to respond that this is an event that is serious, that you need to evacuate your home? Uh, how do we communicate that, that risk? It's, it's difficult, it's challenging. I worked uh, with predictive services and, and trying to get our fire managers to respond to, uh, this is an event where uh, we're gonna need a lot of resources to prepare for this uh, upcoming situation. So how do I communicate that effectively, clearly, uh, so that they can understand what the real risk is? Um, I was hoping that we'd have some uh, questions from the audience here. Um, so folks, please uh, come up to the mics and um, we'll start, uh, start with you. Hello. Hi, my name is Scott Nowicki. I work for Quantum Spatial. Uh, so the, the models that you're suggesting and the risks that you're suggesting are, are great. You're, you're giving it a number, you're giving it a, a color. 
Um, and there are certainly things that we could do with that information. You could go in, fly planes, map hazards, like we could do tree mapping, we could do fuel mapping, we could do all these things that would help in the short term like deal with these situations. But they cost money that is not allocated as part of the firefighting regime. So is there a way to take this modeling and these risks and actually turn it into dollars, or at least a, an indication of, of costs in order to be able to say, here are the things we could do. We could do defensive uh, treatments, or like there, there are all these things that cost, whatever, a couple hundred thousand dollars to, to deal with large areas, but is there a way to communicate that it's worth investing that through these models and, and kind of risk uh, maps? Let me see if I understood the question. Are you asking, can we go a step beyond the risk to translate them into economic impacts? Is that kind of what you're getting at? And to be in, like you were suggesting that the, the hazard map could, could recommend actions, but unless there's actually dollars associated with those actions, it's a, uh, the, there's a gap there in information, right? So you can't really drive the public to do a, to change a lot of things. You have to drive uh, organizations to actually do something. So yeah, can you turn risk into a real dollar threat? I mean, it seems to me that you could. <laughs> you know, you could do something like that. And I ultimately, I think what you're kind of getting at is how do you create a business case here to do preventive activities instead of always being behind the eight ball? I think that's what I'm hearing. And you know that is the way to convince policymakers that you have to make investments in these kinds of things. Um, I, I'm not close enough to this particular science, but from some of the stuff we small, saw this morning, for example, uh, that one chart that had if you uh, did some mitigation activities that was in the climate talk earlier today, and you, you just mitigate it, you know, whatever, 25% of them, there's the reduction. I mean, it certainly seems to me that it could all be translated into dollars, I would suspect. All right, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question, I think. <laughs> uh, Dar Mims, uh, California Resources Board, and thank you guys for all for the wonderful talks. and. I had a comment first, and then I'm going to ask a question. The comment was on smoke impact uh, translation to the public, and we're doing a heck of a job here in California, in my opinion. Of course, I'm biased, but we do have 35 local air districts in the Air Resources Board, and we also have a program called the Air Resource Advisors who come out to large wildfires and provide information to, to the public to kind of fill that gap because we understand that it is a huge amount of information that needs to be translated in a very short time to a public who, to you guys' point, needs to understand it at a, a more visceral level than sometimes we as scientists is able to convey. Anyway, to my question, uh, you guys are talking a lot about the risk on the landscape, and to me, and I'm in the prescribed fire business, that risk is translated in, in these wildfires. And I'm trying to see how you, we can take what you guys are offering in terms of information and development of tools towards that broader landscape question, because even if we do prevent some of these ignition, the potential for wildfire still is huge in California, somewhere around 10 million acres need to be treated. Anyway, I'll leave it at that and uh, ready for your response. Thank you. So one of the things that we're working on too is um, quantifying the, the sort of window of conditions where wildfires happen and the window of conditions where prescribed fires happen. Um, by leveraging the, the spatial information, it gives us something that we've never had before, which is the ability to, to look at landscapes um, as a whole rather than individual locations of weather stations. So what, what some of this can give us is a, a way to identify opportunities, opportunities for, for fuels treatment or prescribed fire, and to essentially map the, the ideal set of conditions uh, spatially to start opening up those windows and saying, hey, here, the conditions here are, are moderate and suitable for, for using prescribed fire as a landscape scale uh, treatment. And I think that, that some of the gridded, the things that we're working on now uh, uh, are definitely pointing to our ability to, 
to kind of map out or contrast the places where we typically get wildfires and the places where we can have prescribed fire to, to increase those opportunity spaces. All right, uh, let's thank our panelists once more. Thank you.